Thank you all for joining us again for our ninth biennial cocktail hour chats. This is actually our last chat. I can't believe the exhibition went so fast and these last nine weeks of chatting to artists in the show have gone by so fast. So um, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is all connected to the South Dakota governor's ninth biennial art exhibition. Um, and so when we opened the show, we we're still in the throngs of a pandemic, although we're kind of coming out of it now. So instead of planning an opening reception or reception for the exhibition while it's on display at the South Dakota Art Museum, we decided to do these little chats with three or four artists over the, cross of the course of nine weeks. Um, so we have been hearing from 30 artists out of the 66 artists in the exhibition. Um, and so every week, um, the show, a little bit of background on the show before we get into the chats is um, it's the ninth biennial. So we started in 2003. It takes about a year to organize the show and a year to travel each time we do this. Um, so the show opened at the South Dakota Art Museum in March of 2021 and is closing here on June 13th, 2021. Um, so if you've got a chance to check it out in the next week before it comes down, come on out and see it. Um, after we close the show, it will travel to the Washington Pavilion in Sioux Falls. From there, it'll go to the University Art Galleries at the University of South Dakota in the fall for about a month. And then it'll head out to the Doll Art Center in Rapid City where it'll close in March of 2022, about a year after we started the tour. Um, so um, each of these chats that we've been doing with three or four artists, I've kind of grouped the artists around a common theme. Um, and tonight we're hearing from four women artists um, that all either in their works themselves or, or what they say in their artist statement are drawing some sort of connections between the natural world um, and humanity. Um, and so I, I think they're a really good fit together. I'm excited to hear from all four of the artists tonight. Um, we have Becky Grismer with us, Angela Behrens, Jenny Freitag, and Susan Hegestead. Um, so with that, I think we will go ahead and thank the artists for coming and hear from them. We'll hear from each of them about 10 to 15 minutes each. Um, we save the questions for the most part until the end. So if you do have a question, you can go ahead and put that into the chat at any time. I mean, we can pull that up and pose it to the artists. So we'll have a little bit of time at the end for those or any more questions that come up. But otherwise, we will go ahead and hear from each of our four artists. Thank you all. And we will go ahead and pass it over to Becky. I'm actually not seeing Becky here all oh. of a sudden, which mm -hmm. might be my view. Let me, yep. I'm not seeing her either. We might have lost She her. must have dropped off, yes. Yep, so we'll go ahead and move forward. These things happen. Um, <laughs> we're used to kind of working on the fly. We'll go ahead and I think then first we'll hear from Angela Behrens and we'll catch up with Becky when she's able to tune back in with us. All right. I think Jenny was going to go first, wasn't yeah. she? Oh, she was. And then I forget the order. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and go with there Jenny. There we go. <laughs> yeah, Jenny, thanks. We'll go ahead and pitch it over to you. Okay. Um, hi there. Um, I'm Jenny. I don't know for sure how to start, but I'll just, um, I live in Madison, South Dakota. Uh, I've, art, I've been making art for the, as long as I can remember. My, my most recent memories are, I grew up at Lake Madison before there were very many people living on Lake Madison. And I wandered around and picked up pretty rocks and seashells. And I I knew where the clam beds were and the crayfish were and I just you know kind of grew up that way and um, my art was facilitated by my parents. They, My mom always had the picnic table set up for me to paint rocks and decorate things and she taught me how to sew when I was really young so I knew you know what to do there and uh, I don't know I just I, I can't think of a time where I wasn't making art. Uh, I went to college at Dakota State University here in Madison back when they had an art major and got a teaching degree with that. And uh, my, my main area that I was concentrating in was always clay. Um, I paint a little, um, I do a lot of mixed media uh, with my clay, but it seems that clay always draws me in. Um, whenever I'm in rough times, the clay tends to heal. Um, it's just uh, something that I really relate to. And uh, I, I, Connie Herring was my clay professor at Dakota State University, and she's been a, a mentor of mine for many years. I've also studied with Hazel Belvo um, up in Grand Marais and then Deborah Fritz down in Abiquiu. And 
I, uh, I make a lot of art with Angela Behrens, who's one of the artists and we hang out and just kind of do some stuff together. And we have a really good time. We sit outside and do clay. We've, we've traveled together. We walk, we observe nature, we talk. So I have a lot of people that, you know, are very inspirational to me. And I was really excited um, to get into the governor's show with a lot of wonderful people. And um, it was, it was just an exciting thing. So um, I'm certainly open for questions, but I think I'm going to go to, if I can find it here, my share screen for a minute. And yeah. All right. We're on it. Thank you. Okay. This You're is welcome. the piece, um, Equinoctial Quartet. This is the piece I had in the show or I have in the show. And um, I made this one during uh, the beginning of COVID-19. And um, it was just one of those pieces where I was, the birds in my head were calling for spring. And so it's, I don't know, I, I really do like this piece. I think it's powerful, um, very spiritual. And uh, I don't know, I guess that kind of, that's where the piece is coming from is that idea that I, I needed spring. We all need spring when we're in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. You can go to the next one. Um, this was, I was working earlier with Raku and this one was Raku fired with horsehair feathers and basalt stones I collected in Grand Marais. And I loved working with the Raku firing, but I was just having so much trouble with um, cracking and, you know, not getting the glazes I wanted. And it was, um, it was beautiful when it happened, but I lost at least 50%, if not more of my pieces. And that was frustrating. So I I kind of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm transferring into an, an, a new clay body and that's kind of where my work is right now. But that, I like this piece. So I thought I'd show this one. Next. Um, this is another Raku piece. Um, this is about, you know, the water ex when I was growing up and surrounded by the stones. Um, I use a lot of horse hair in my work that goes uh, back to a teaching moment. And um, when a student brought me some horse hair, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a long story, but that's, that's the basic part of it. Um, I think I put cavities in the work a lot just to kind of show the, the strength of the nurturer, to nurture nature, to nurture children, to nurture whatever, you know, you're thinking about uh, that's precious to you. Next one. Um, this one's called Sticks and Stones. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble. It's a hard night for Becky. This is a night for me where um, my son passed uh, seven years ago tomorrow and I've just been struggling for a couple of days, but bear with me. I'm sorry. Um, he's one of those things held most precious to me, of course. Um, this one, Sticks and Stones, and I just uh, think it's a beautiful piece. She's so uh, gracious, I think, and uh, very sealed, but yeah, this one has driftwood and seed beads and a stone. Next one. This one's precious. This is me and Julian possibly together. Next one. Uh, this one is, um, this one's giving me a message. Um, thank you. Um, this one is the bees are gone, but the honey remains. Um, this one's also, I, I find this one very um, powerful for me. Um, and this is, you know, the different medium. This is working with a black clay body using oxides, uh, velvet underglazes, um, excuse me, on gobies before, before the process. And then uh, the velvet underglazes. And then I'm using um, a lot of oxides that I mix, multiple firings. Um, some mixed media in this piece, and I did use some gold leaf in this piece. Um, lately, I've been using, I've been firing the gold right on now, but this piece does have the gold leaf applied uh, later. I think that, I don't know if there's another one or not. Oh, yeah, uh, these are kind of fun. Um, make me smile, that's a good thing. Uh, Angela and I were outside working a year ago, about, I think, and we were, we were playing a playing and she was making bison and I started making horses and I really didn't know where they were coming from but I was having so much fun so I make a lot of horses uh we have some history of horses in the family I don't have a horse now but 
there's there's some stuff there. So it makes some sense to me now that I've thought about it, but these are little ones. Um, next one. And here's one more. Um, yeah, this one's uh, the strength of three moons, I believe, has the blue circles in places. All right, that's the end of my slideshow. And um, I don't know, I'd love to you know talk about it at the end if anybody wants to talk, but that's about it, I think. Yeah, and Jenny, about how big are these pieces of yours? Oh, the horses are small, anywhere from like, you know, maybe five inches tall and, you know, eight, and then some are a little bit bigger. And I've made some really big horses too, but that's not what I usually do. Um, some of my uh, figures are as tall as I can get them to get into the kiln. So they're, they're approaching like 30 inches in height. They're, they're pretty big. Okay. Yeah, that one with driftwood, when you said driftwood on the screen, I think I thought the pieces were a, a bit smaller, but then you said driftwood and I thought that must be oh, decently sizable. Oh, no, that's sizable. a small piece of driftwood in that particular Is it? one. Okay. Those, those are about 18 inches tall. They're tall vertical pieces, but sure. um, yeah, it's not a giant driftwood piece. I, I should try yeah. that sometime. <laughs> yeah, and, and can you, um, that would be great. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Um, can you explain what onglobies are? That, well, they're an impossible thing to get right now. Um, Amico quit making them, but they are just basically um, a way to add another layer of slit to the clay. Um, and you could, I've been using either white on gobies or black. Um, and it's just, it's kind of giving the, the clay body I'm using is dark. So if I put a white um, on goby there, then I can etch through it. And I can, um, you know, it's kind of fun to do that. You can, you know, almost like a scruffito type of thing. Sure. So they give you another layer of, of clay. Um, they're very similar to a slip, but not quite. Um, I, Amico quit making them. Um, it was one of those things where I was always going to them for it. And so now um, Dakota Potters is mixing one for me. It's pretty good. They do a great job there. But I'm, I got um, shine on a piece that came out this morning. I got some shine on it, which I like a matte finish. I don't want the gloss. So that was uh, something I'll have to work on. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I am so sorry about your son. And now I'm thinking what an awful time for me to schedule you. So I'm so. No, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's okay. Well, we're glad to have you here. Thanks for sharing Thank that with us. Um, so I guess the question is, should we capture Becky in case we lose her again? And I think maybe we will go ahead and we'll do, um, we'll go to Becky next. So thank you so much. Um, Ginny, and here is Becky. Thank you. I'm so sorry, my um, no internet worries. connection just kicked, kicked yeah. me off right away when we started. It um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, um, it's great to be here today. Um, and um, I'm excited that, um, you know, we're all here together and, and talking about our work. And um, it's really cool to be joined together with people from across the state. And um, so I will, um, so this is my sculpture that is in the show. It's um, called Banana Tree. Um, and it's made with um, ceramic and tree bark um, and then some other mixed media. Um, and if you wanted to go to the next screen. Um, I thought I would kind of talk about um, a little bit about how my work has evolved into um, what I'm making today and then um, then kind of specifically about the process that I used to create the piece that I had in my or in the show here. Um, so going way way back um, I attended NSU and my focus was mostly in painting um, but I, I really loved working in a variety of media. And um, so one thing that kind of kept coming up in my work was um, that I would see all of these human qualities and gestures and human features in non-human objects. Um, and that kind of led me to um, first um, making a, a painting series of these um, like anthropomorphic lamps. Um, so they were essentially portraits of, of lamps. And um, so I was kind of hyper-focused on uh, viewing all of the things around me in, in that way. 
And at the same time, I had a sculpture class um, that I had a found objects project in. Um, and I noticed a piece of tree bark that looked like part of a part of a torso and it had like a little insect hole um, with the belly button. I don't know if you can kind of see uh, in the center there. Um, but anyway, so I decided that I would, um, you know, gather up these pieces and kind of working around that piece, create a figure. Um, and, you know, I really enjoyed making it and um, I had a positive uh, response from it. So when I started making art, um, full-time, uh, I kind of decided to kind of follow, uh, that direction or, you know, follow that kind of cue. Um, so you can go to the next one. So as I developed the pieces, um, I, you know, was kind of experimenting with different materials and, um, different adhesives and, um, you know, trying to come up with ways of, um, you know, preserving the materials and um, kind of um, playing with stones and um, metal leaf. And, um, and then, you know, like as I was, I guess as I was out gathering materials, um, you know, I'm seeing all of these uprooted tree stumps in the forest and um, noticing the gestures of um, like the weeping willow branches and and the birch bark was you know peeling away from its limbs and um, so I started kind of feeling like a really strong connection or like a bond with with the the trees around me um, and kind of like we were sharing experiences together um, like I had just been uprooted and you know we had just moved to Spearfish from Minneapolis and it was putting down my my roots in this new area and I you know wept I missed missed my friends and my family and um so then I, I started making pieces that were um kind of specifically about some of these like common characteristics that I was um feeling or or these parallels um, you can go to the next one. Um, so some examples. Um, this is a piece called Roots um, and is kind of about, um, you know, obviously putting, putting down our roots and establishing roots. Um, and then you can go to the next. And this is a piece called New Skin and it's made with um, hickory and birch and those are both uh, trees that naturally exfoliate their um, their bark or their skin, um, and uh, you can go to the next. And this is a, a shot of a piece called Weep, um, and uses the um, the weeping willow branches um, to kind of drape across a woman. Um, and you can go to the next. Um, so then I started um, paying... Um, well, I guess I, I started following some ceramic sculptors and I had some friends that were you know, sculpting with clay and um, I was just became really interested in it. And so I started to incorporate um, ceramic and I, I really liked that it was another natural material um, and I could it kind of gave me some more um, control or or power. Like I was wasn't limited by the the material um, where I could um, you know I could sculpt fingers and find details that I couldn't before. Um, so this is a piece about um, being uprooted uh, or displaced. Um, and then you can go to the next. So then I started kind of making um, like little narrative scenes with them and um, kind of like enjoying being able to tell a story and um, and so this piece is um, called Obsession and is about the um, like the the common um, you know when trees lose their, they go through the cycle of losing their, um, their leaves, it's 
um, called abscission. And in humans, you know, we do this with our hair um, and those phases, um, catagen, antigen, telogen. Um, the, um, there was also kind of like a, um, a parallel where, you know, I was, I was applying a lot of my personal experience, like what I was going through. Um, and this was kind of one of them I had um, in a form of alopecia and, um, and was kind of considering like how, you know, that happens with humans. And um, anyway, uh, you can go to the next. Um, so this is uh, another one of the sort of scenes um, about the life cycle, um, just that, you know, we're, trees and humans are, you know, ephemeral and, um, and that there's, you know, we're, ex we experience the, the loss of life through either human action or, um, by natural causes, um, disease and, and so forth. And then we also, you know, reproduce and create children and little saplings and, um, and kind of are arranged in little families. Um, and you can go forward. And then, so then in a broader sense, I, um, you know, we have communities or, you know, the families are arranged in communities and um, forests and shelter belts. And there's these, this huge interaction that happens. And um, and then this is a, an example of, um, I actually created, you know, the pieces, the pieces that I was making before were, um, you know, around 20, 25 inches tall. And then, so I decided to kind of um, make like a, a, a large installation that was like a stand of trees. So I kind of used the same um, method, but just uh, scaled it way up. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is the, so the process for making the piece in my in the show, um, I was going through photos and I had snapped a bunch of photos. I didn't remember that I did it, um, but I had snapped a bunch of photos so I could kind of include them here. Um, so one night I was, I went down into my kitchen and I was eating a banana and I was standing against the counter and I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the window and I, was noticing how the banana peel like fell it was draped against my hand and I was like that looks that's really cool and then I started um just kind of thinking about uh fruit trees and um you know if you know what what a banana tree would look like and um and then I I like to kind of incorporate a sense of humor into um some of my pieces and stuff so this is kind of a um, my interpretation of what a banana tree is. Um, so basically the, the top of this, um, so at the waist, um, the bottom portion is just, um, kind of serving as a stand, like a temporary stand, um, but won't be part of the sculpture. Um, but I basically just, um, if you want to go to the next one, so, you know, sculpt, sculpt the figure, um, I put under glazes, and then I do like a, carp, a copper carbonate wash, and then fire it, and then when it comes out, I, you can kind of see, um, I embed a, like a, a wire with epoxy um, into the body cavity. Um, you can go forward, and then you can kind of see in the background of this, um, the, there's a couple of um, figures that are on wires and they're kind of hanging out in the styrofoam, stuck in the styrofoam there. Um, but then, so I am working on the, the base of this piece is called um, Breathing Right. Um, and I, I work kind of in multiples. So I'll um, just kind of do like assembly line in a way. Um, and then if you want to go to the next one, um, and this is kind of a, a shot. I'm kind of almost done with um, sculpting the hips, um, but it's pretty, you know, rough at that point. Um, and you can go to the next. 
And then um, this is kind of the end of the process. Um, so after the base and hips are sculpted, um, I actually separate the pieces and then I use um, additional um, cold finishes like I'll um, to, uh, use a heat gun and um, use encaustic to kind of seal the the pores of the um, of the ceramic and if I want um, I use ink washes and um, so they kind of behave differently if you if you have like a sealed surface versus if it um, accepts that um, that ink um, but then I so I, I submerge the bottom in, in polyurethane. Um, so I don't necessarily want to submerge the whole thing. Um, so I join them together and then um, you can kind of see in the one in the background, um, I kind of use the, um, you know, use the wax and kind of hide the seam a little bit and kind of work on the transition. Um, and then you can go forward. And then, um, and then at the very end, I'll um, kind of go over it with, I use metal effects paint to get the rusted patina um, and um, to kind of create uh, cohesion. I'll, um, you know, go over and apply the same, um, you know, the same finish to the top and the bottom to kind of bring it together. Um, and then this is just another view and then you can go ahead um, another view of the piece in the show and that's what I have thank you thank you so much it was so good to hear about your process like that because it is a um, very curious use of materials and forms that's not some sort of traditional standard practice so thanks for sharing all of that yeah you're welcome yeah okay well we'll go ahead and move on and hear from Angela next All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I am so pleased to see so many familiar names and faces and um, also to be part of this group. Um, it's just, it's wonderful. So is my screen showing up? Looks great. Okay, good. Good. Um, uh, uh, what I what I wanted to do with this presentation is to um, share the the body of work that developed around the piece that I have in the governor's show. So a um, little bit of background. Um, I live in Madison. I'm spending the summer in Olympia, Washington, actually, with horses. So if anybody needs their fix, you, I can hook you up for a couple of days more. Um, so I, I teach at Dakota State University and um, the interactions that I have with my students drive a lot, a lot of, of what, I, um, what I think about and what I'm making at any given time. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to work with Ginny and, um, and, uh, Gosh, I don't know what I would do without without my art friend in Madison. <laughs> um, not, you know, okay. So here we go. Um, birds that I love to see. Uh, the one exception, we'll get to that. All right, uh, these little guys are goldfinches. This one is um, on, the, on the left side of your screen, I believe, is called Intrinsic. And the reason that that got that title is because it's right there on the spool of thread. That was the, the name of the, or the brand of the thread. And then on the right side is Zippy the goldfinch. He's quick. Um, color has been a really wonderful thing to be able to play around with and um, I, I tend to sort of make one thing and then move on and so this, this has um, kept my interest with um, the, the ability to uh, work a little bit, little bit more in a series um, and a little bit more with multiples. So. Um, uh, yeah, 
So that's been fun. Um, we have the Stellar's Jays. The one in the back is called Over It, and the one in the front is called Burley. And then the three Cardinals, and from left to right, they are the other Cardinal, uh, Red Bird for the win, and Go Cardinal Go. And then the blue bird on the right is Head East. Um, okay, so a lot, of, a lot of this started when I was able to participate in the Christmas bird count um, in Madison. We went to Lake Herman State Park and your job is basically to walk around and identify birds and, um, and mark them on a sheet. So that's through the Audubon Society. And that was kind of the first time that I really started learning a, a lot of names that I, that I, um, that I didn't know before. And so this little black and white with the red patch is the hairy woodpecker with a few, you know, a little bit of artistic license there. And um, it ended up being very, very happy on a chunk of lilac. So that is lilac epiphany. Um, the one on the right is Raku, and um, it's got some mixed media elements, of course. And um, it's called Sweetie Pie. And I started messing around and make a lot of little pinch bowls. Some of them are just for glaze testers and some of them are just because it keeps my brain and my hands busy while I'm, you know, wandering around and looking over my students' shoulders and, you know, and uh, making sure that they're trying to do what I asked them to do. So, um, so I took a pinch bowl and um, it, it became four birds bowl, um, which I definitely want to explore a little bit more going forward. And these guys are Axel 1 and Axel 2. There's a raven and a crow. And the raven gets the larger wheel, of course. And this one is pelican, simply. Um, it's, it's balanced on a, uh, an old porcelain doorknob that came out of my house, <laughs> actually off of my garage. It shouldn't have been outside, but it was. So um, th that's where it is. And the, um, the doorknob and the bird are attached to each other, but the whole thing comes off of that little stand. So I carved a little um, depression in the top of the pedestal so that um, it, it can be shifted a little bit if you choose to, to show it that way. And I'm sorry about the documentation. This isn't um, is not a good illustration here, but um, this gets us to the exception. Um, birds that I love to see are the ones that I actually have seen, and the one on the left is called Made of Stars, and so obviously I fabricated that that idea and that bird. Um, it's holding roots, little root tendrils that glow in the dark, and they cascade onto. Um, onto a piece that used to be test grid, but now it's the base for, um, for Made of Stars. Um, the idea being connecting um, the birds and the earth and the sky and, the, the, and, and people to everything. Like everything is, is um, touching everything else and connected to everything else. So starts to bring the environment into um, so it's not not just about birds, um, or not just about the the, the initial object. Um, so the one on the right is called um, chickadees and pants, and the the sculpture pants used to be a standalone piece, but when I realized that it had three arms, and I had exactly three chickadees, that those two needed to be together. And so there's um, details over on the right side of the two adults and then the little baby, which I think is just adorable. <laughs> um, and the top of pants has those little glow in the dark dots on it. So when you see it in low light conditions after it's had a, a light bath, um, it's, it's pretty fun to look at. All right, I wasn't aware of doing that, but there it happened. Um, 
This one on the left is called Cloud Nine, and mainly I made this because it makes me so happy to hear the Red Wing Blackbird song. Just makes me happy. So I found a place for it to live. And the one on the right is Over the Moon. So Little Raven, she, um, actually she's gone through a little bit of a change. Um, she was in a gallery and she um, like didn't get a lot of attention and so when I took the moon and the green away and just had her on a post on the base um, then I think she got the attention that she deserved so the 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 shiny colors actually are no longer with this piece um, they're gonna have to find another thing to do All right, and here is the piece in the South Dakota Governor's Ninth Biennial Art Exhibition. Um, it is called Plaid Grass, and I do love seeing yellow-headed blackbirds and hearing them. Um, and uh, this is a raku piece on another wood wedge. So these wedges that I like to use, um, and you haven't seen too many of them today, but they are the, I call them the death wedge because it's the first, first cut that, that you would make to take down a tree. So I wanted to, I guess, honor, yeah, honor the trees. And then um, the grass is, is again, talking about the environment and gosh, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, it's like, <clears throat> okay, maybe, maybe I'll have to stop there. <laughs> I'll, I can come back to this later if there are questions about it, but um, uh, th that's, that's uh, the grass is the important part that ties that entire biome together. And without that, um, the birds aren't going to be there, and without that, we wouldn't be here either. So there's my soapbox. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Angela, and thanks, thanks for thanks for getting that out so we understand what your what it was that was so important to you there. I know it's not, <laughs> not easy, but thanks for sharing that. Thank you so much. Okay, well, we will go ahead and we'll move on to um, Susan and hear from her. If any of you have any questions, um, go ahead and make sure to put them in the chat now if you want to, and we'll have, I think, a little bit of time too when Susan is done. So thank you. Yeah, I'll be short. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's really lovely to see everyone and uh, like uh, the other artists tonight. Thank you, big thanks to Jody and everyone at the South Dakota Arts uh, Museum, uh, certainly all the folks involved in uh, promoting this show and taking it all over the state and uh, being a really wonderful opportunity for artists in South Dakota. Um, certainly look forward to seeing the show, um, let alone being able to be invited to be a part of it. So. Uh, I just wanted to share that. Uh, and also it's just been really, really lovely to be in this group of artists. I, I hope that uh, I can hold a candle. Um, it's a, there's an interesting tie that I find um, intriguing. And, uh, and I, I guess I also wanna just take a moment to thank uh, Jenny who's here dealing with it's gonna make me, you know, it's been a tough year. These are really lovely people and I really appreciate what you've shared tonight, especially with all of the other things that you might be carrying. So anyway, I didn't expect that to get to me that way, but uh, it, it's meaningful to share those moments with people. So thank you. So 
so my name's Susan. I didn't introduce myself yet. <laughs> Susan Hegestead, I'm a visual artist. I am a native of South Dakota, uh, born and currently live in Vermilion. Family on both sides go way back. And so I suppose it's in my blood, it's in my, my bones. Um, even though I did spend the majority of my life on either coast in my formative years, but ultimately came back and have uh, really been fed by the group of, of people I've come to know as well as just, you know, my community here in Vermilion. So I am an artist who works uh, primarily in printmaking and papermaking, uh, occasionally bookmaking and, and other mixed media um, found object sculpture is something I, I really have fun with once in a while. But the piece that uh, is in the show is a mixed media two-dimensional piece, um, but I do uh, make both two-dimensional as well as um, three-dimensional work. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There we go. All right. So if we're working, which I assume we are, I see it on my screen. So uh, I, I do have just a few images and they're, they're somewhat chronological, um, but more and more I am starting to try to move away from that way of thinking as uh, certainly in my life, but I think for others, I see how things happen in cycles, um, not only in what I make and in sort of my, my personal life, but I think uh, the stories that we tell ourselves as well have interesting cycles. And anyway, sometimes it's nice to try to get away from that, a very linear way of thinking, here's who I was 10 years ago, and here's 15 years ago, and here's, I mean, there's something to that. But the first image that you see is uh, a piece that marks the culmination of my undergraduate work. Uh, and, I was introduced to both printmaking and papermaking under Lloyd Menard uh, here in Vermilion at USD and just fell into it. Um, I, one, didn't intend to come back to South Dakota at that point in time. I was going to school in Santa Cruz, California. Um, I did not expect to like find this wonderful uh, community of interesting people. Um, and I didn't think that I was going to be an art major. Although, like some others have said tonight, you know, I, I've made things for as long as I can remember. I've always been a creative, hands-on kind of person. And, um, you know, in hindsight, it's all, it's all natural, but it was not what I thought I was going to be doing. Uh, and uh, one of my first classes was with Lloyd, and he's like, you need to be in printmaking. And so I said, sure. And um, that's going to be a thread <laughs> throughout tonight as well, is recognizing uh, reactions to things that I may or may not have chosen very consciously. Uh, but here I was amongst really uh, wonderful people and learning things, and I, I found that I just felt at home. And even though it took me a great deal of time, you know, to get through it, because um, I had children while I was in undergraduate school, um, I, I knew that I had sort of found the corner where I where I needed to be in my niche. And uh, I especially, especially loved making paper. Uh, and that was something that I experimented with, I think, even more um, intuitively and passionately as a, as a young person. Um, uh, a significant number of works in my undergraduate exhibition uh, were sculptural paper works uh, and, and certainly prints as well, but I, I, I found this sort of little rut of prolificness, if you will, and that I was just so excited about a lot of these mixed media sculptural paper pieces and by and large they're very uh, biographical because I was casting my own body in plaster and then tamping wet fresh made sheets of paper into that to create these sculptural forms. The body was 
you know, something I had to work with. And it just, those were compelling images to me, images of the body. And I, I didn't totally know yet why, but it was always there. It was kind of a fixation. Um, and uh, my professor Lloyd uh, numerous times encouraged me to think about uh, studying particular women artists uh, when it was time for me to apply to grad school was, you need to study with a woman. And at the time I was like, it doesn't matter who I study with. I'm gonna study with whoever I want. I'm gonna make the art I wanna make. It doesn't matter who teaches me. But he actually, I think he saw something that I didn't wanna recognize yet. And, and that is that uh, the gendered experience of the world is, is pretty important to me. Um, and a lot of works that I have subsequently made uh, deal with those issues. Um, and that also connects to the body. I think that we are uh, beings wh whose knowledge comes from a great many more places than we tend to recognize, I think, especially in the Western world. And um, uh, a it, it's not just a poetic sense, but also just the very real, like, scientific sense that we interpret the world through our bodies as much as we do through our eyes or our minds, you know, it touch, but it, it is also uh, like the physical beingness, right, that affects our world so much. Uh, so, uh, long story longer to follow a little bit chronology. I, I, I went uh, to graduate school in Buffalo, New York, and my, my primary advisor was uh, Adele Hendricks, and she is a Midwestern printmaker, but does so much more than that. And uh, it wasn't her work so much that influenced me, but a sort of quiet, uh, intense confidence. Um, that she has that uh, really, I think, pushed me in particular. I, I felt very uh, encouraged, and it, and it wasn't just my my female advisor. It was it was a really wonderful environment as well in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and I continued to experiment in pr printmaking. Uh, largely, I have gravitated toward collagraph printmaking. Uh, collagraph being an intaglio process of printmaking uh, where you, you build up a surface, not unlike collage, but there's texture, right, on your, your, your printing plate. And once it's sealed, you would wipe ink into it uh, like an intaglio print. You need to run it through a press with dampened paper. And the resulting print is very textural, right? You can you can often really see precisely what it was there on the printing plate. And if you look at this image, uh, which is from a slightly later body of work, you can see that doily in the center there. And if you look at the green legs in particular, you kind of get a sense of the depth of that embossment. So, you know, needless to say, as a printmaker, I'd been introduced to all the various techniques, but there was something about collagraph that just felt so satisfying to me. It is, it is a great deal of work to wipe a plate of any size when you're using like fabrics and doilies and yarn and, you know, things like that. But uh, what comes out of that process. And again, it's very physical. You have to use your body, it, you know, not to the degree that some sculpting is, but it's still, it, it's a very physical activity. Um, I love being able to wipe a collagraph plate and then uh, run it through the press multiple times on different surfaces, right? So that initial inking will continue to, you know, give an impression for three or sometimes four more impressions. So I start mixing and matching sheets of paper, sometimes fabrics, right? And uh, the first impression is, is intense. You, you're picking up the most ink. The second impression is a little bit lighter, right? And you can, can maybe apply a little more pressure on the press. But you know, each subsequent pulling of a print then has a very varying intensities of, of the color. And so then you go back over those, right? With different um, 
uh, plates. And in general, my printing plates are just fields of texture. Um, I am not as interested in creating very particular imagery in printmaking um, to then reproduce, right? And that's kind of, at least for most, for most folks, that's the purpose of bothering to make prints is the fact that you can make multiples, um, make in, in print editions. And I hate that. I hate editioning. I, I hate the idea of trying to make anything the same more than once. I don't know. It's a thing that's, it's, it's very intense. So it's weird, right? That I became a printmaker. It had nothing to do with it. Being a printmaker had everything to do with the people that I fell in love with and and then, you know, grooving on, on Collagraph. But uh, I like to make variations. So um, I, I think this is a lot about me. This is a lot about my life. I'm someone who, like, wears a million different hats, and I, I must like it because I can't quit. I can't seem to stop. Um, the... It, the process of, of printing this way allows me to amass, uh, you know, lots of different versions of elements that are appearing in different ways in, you know, different intensities and different colors. Um, and then sometimes at the very end, I'll, I'll lay down a stencil, uh, you know, on the third or fourth pass of some print. Um, and that's where you get imagery like this, where the torso you see is a stencil as well as the the legs hanging in the center of the torso on the last pass and and i'll talk about the stitched pieces in a second because that's separate um i i printed a a more of a flat surface um, plate in green on top of the blue and so the stencil right only allowed ink to come through some places and so um that's about as specific I get in, in making printing plates because I like to wait until the end, have these stacks of things in different colors and, and then go back in and either I'm gonna, I'm gonna add one more layer and stencil or in this case, uh, a, a whole body of work that developed with that technique where I was pulling from these old prints and cutting them up and and putting them back together with stitching. Um, and so bear with me, I'm bringing it full circle, or somewhat half circle back to the, the previous image in that stitching, okay? So whereas in the undergraduate um, work, I, I was using stitching, it was something I like to do, but in that particular piece, it, it was actually because I had a, a mistake, like the, the paper didn't come out of the, the cast the way I want it. And so I decided to stitch the pieces together instead. And in that process was like, wow, I really like this. And I hadn't even uh, intended that. Um, and so I began doing this in about 2013, 2014, cutting up old prints and stitching them as opposed to a more straightforward mixed media with paper, like gluing. I, I thought I, very, uh, acutely aware that I needed to, to play with the stitching, um, I do have a background as a, um, a, a stitcher and doing costumes and, and stuff like that on the side, but uh, it, to me, uh, the, the femininity of, right, it's, it's a, a woman's uh, craft, <laughs> if we call it, and there's this whole world of crafts made by women. Um, and, that I, I recognize, okay, that's an important um, language too now. And, and then on top of that is in uh, this, uh, this particular piece is actually postgraduate school. I've come back, um, bought a house, settled down, I'm here in Vermilion, and, uh, and then I go through a subsequent divorce and I start just playing with these prints and cutting them apart, stitching them back together and, and recognizing in the process that the reason why I'm so fixated on the body is because, you know, at least in my history, but I know for many people, I'm carrying this stuff around from a, a traumatic childhood that needs to be processed. It needs 
to to come out because it's there and it's affecting how I move in the world and and operate with other people. Um, and so this body of work of which there are about 22 pieces in all was was completely finished in 2018-ish, uh, 2017-2018 uh, when I first exhibited it. And it, it deals with violence and with uh, the bodily processing of violence in our world. And of course, for me, the, the gendered experience is pretty profound and a pretty important part of that. Although I, I, I do believe um, that all people carry trauma and they've either been able to address it or not, um, but that trauma affects us physiologically as well as psychologically. And I think in the West, we're only beginning to to fully grapple with that and uh, provide ways for people to deal with it because it can be dealt with. And for me, you know, light bulb goes off as well. It's like, that's why I'm an artist. That's why I keep letting myself fall into these situations where I have an opportunity to, to learn or be a part of new making processes because that is how I have come to try to work through that the you know and it's not uncommon and and Ginny said it and I think a lot of people recognize uh, that being an artist has been about some sort of uh, personal journey of sorting <laughs> their life out in some way right right so um, not to beleaguer that too much but you know there are certainly days where and be like, why do I keep doing this? Why am I an artist? It's more expensive than it's worth. It's like backbreaking sometimes. And like, you're always killing yourself about whether or not it's good enough. But it's because this, this is, this is the only way to function for me. I have to keep doing this and thinking about these things in order to process them. Um, it, it, I guess one more note about that body of work is that all of the titles come from um, an essay by my favorite author, uh, Rebecca Solnit, called Men Explain Things to Me. Um, and in that essay, there are some heartbreaking, uh, mind-blowing actual facts about um, the effects of violence, specifically domestic violence, and it's, um, it's a pandemic. Domestic violence is a pandemic. And uh, anyway, it, it was very uh, useful for me to read that and to process it. And um, it's made me, I think, much more consciously aware of how it permeates so much of our world. Um, but I but I can't ever stick with one thing. I'm not I'm not good at like just being the one thing. So uh, I love books and I play with books and alter books sometimes. This is a piece from about 2011, I think, um, incorporating uh, found objects into these rather small wall hung pieces. Um, and there's, there's a handful of them that I've made over the years. Um, and they don't tie as neatly to the other things. Um, but I, I find myself a collector, right, of ephemera, of small objects, interesting forms. And sometimes I don't know why, but I just need to have them. And then every once in a while, right, they, they just kind of come together. And this is a piece that, that emerged that way. It just felt um, like an interesting statement. Uh, so a little closer to the piece that's in the show, um, I also uh, am someone who, who just simply likes to draw sometimes. Um, I, I'm not one of those, I wish I was, I wish I was a better like everyday kind of drawer, um, but I, I can't quite be that organized. Uh, but I do get, um, I want to call it a primal urge once in a while, this like I just I just want to have something in my hand and I want to make marks. So uh, in a few different periods in my adulthood, I've, I've had these very prolific um, periods of, of making mixed media pieces out of either old prints or out of old other old things. Um, 
And, and that is another connection that I think that I've noticed in my work, and I see it in some of the other ladies who've spoken tonight, but that the cycle of creation and destruction, right? It's this big meta thing, but it's also, this is like a practical experience in the studio. We're constantly like, pulling something out that maybe was a thing 10 years ago and you look at it and you're like, no, now it needs to be this. Now you want to do that, right? And I sometimes feel like I should be um, sad if I have to create, you know, like destroy an old piece, but like that is such an integral piece of, of who I am as well. I think as a person, as an artist, that it doesn't bother me one bit to cut old stuff up or to take it apart. And, you know, I, I think that is really um, important to not be too precious about things. So anyway, I constantly take things apart, put them together in new ways. And this is uh, just a mixed media drawing uh, of using these old bits of prints and drawing over them with gesso uh, and graphite and watercolor. And as I was playing with this little bird stencil, um, and looking at the forms, again, they're just kind of like general textural plates underneath there, but I just suddenly saw this swirling mass and I was like, oh, these birds are a force, right? They're, they are, um, they're cycling through, trying to do their thing, right? But maybe also getting mired in that cycling and not figuring out what they need to do. Anyway, right? Like, whatever goes through your head when you're in the studio. Uh, and then, but at the end, then this one bird is trying to buck the trend. Like, and for me, it like, I was just thinking of it like, here's my focus, right? Like this swirling mass of birds is like a, a person's psyche at any given moment. And the red bird is like, bing, bring yourself back you're here, stop getting caught up. Um, and so I entitled this piece Self-Portrait as a Flock of Birds because I, I thought it, it like represented where I was at. I had a two-year-old, maybe one-year-old, I can't remember. I, I just had my last child um, at 37 um, it, in a blended family. Uh, my husband I met, um, with whom I had my daughter, had uh, three children when I came back from grad school and I had two children. And so it's like my life was pretty chaotic already, but then I did this thing or I had another baby on top, you know? So not to, you know, get too off in the reads about like personal choices, but that stuff is always, you know, coming through in some fashion. I don't, see myself as being a, an illustrative artist. I'm not a narrative artist per se, but uh, any given piece certainly has a, a, an autobiographical sort of seed. Uh, the end product, I'm, I'm much more interested in presenting either compositions or pieces that have some elements of a poetic truth, if you will. So it's not a scene so much as a, an emotional state perhaps, or a, a conceptual state. Uh, and so to bring us, uh, you know, to the end of that sort of arc is the piece that's in the governor's show, uh, which again is uh, just indicative of me just feeling like, I just need to get out a piece of paper and make marks. Uh, and it was an old print and I had played with some uh, colored gesso. And then I just saw this, this form emerge. And this was an early use of the ginkgo leaf for me. I've been playing with it for a couple of years now when I do wanna do more representational things um, because it's history as a, you know, as a species for one, it's one of the oldest species on the planet. And, uh, but in terms of its connection with Hiroshima and, um, you know, there's a story that in the, the scope of uh, where the one or both of the bombs were dropped um, in that the majority of things died or were destroyed, but uh, we have these ginkgo trees 
that survived the blast and uh, eventually sort of healed and are still alive. And so you have this very powerful symbol, I think, in the ginkgo leaf, a ginkgo tree, um, um, but it's also associated with peace uh, and someone who does have this fractured personality and this life of, of juggling lots of things, um, the art making, and then in particular, this piece is about like trying to find that that center. The title, uh, Dissipative Structures, um, is uh, from thermodynamics. Um, and so dissipative systems, right? Or like, I think like a tornado, systems that are open thermodynamically, but right, we, they trend toward entropy. And, you know, in it relates to, to human society, um, but, you know, just like getting oneself in these cycles, um, right, and, and realizing you're giving off your energy to things. Uh, and so it was, it was just, I think, for a moment, uh, a state of recognizing that Given off, you know, your energy for these other things, your life is trending toward whatever, but try to be here, right? Try to find something to uh, focus in on, uh, to bounce back from. Um, the, the figure with the hands, too, hands are something that have been uh, really important in my work all all throughout um, as, you know, part of the body. Um, I think I I have a fascination with how um, we interpret hand gestures. So it has its own language, but of course, it's also like, you know, as an artist, it's how I do things. As a, a being in the world, it's so often how we gather information, right? Um, <clears throat> so, so hands have a, a long uh, history in my work as well. And so, just just to wrap up for folks, uh, you know, I have this fun piece that I love very much in the governor's biennial but for like the last year like my brain is very much back in sculpture again and so uh this is a piece uh completed at the beginning of the year that uh, I have a whole series of paper sculpture because I'm coming back to it and I'm doing all of this embellishment um and in fact the series is called embellishments and then like a a secondary title. This one is Embellishments Adorn Repress. Uh, and I I think that I'm moving, I, I don't really talk about this work yet, so I don't think that I have a super cohesive uh, statement about it. But I, I do think that what I'm doing is I'm trying to open back out again to bigger stories that uh, my last spot major body of work was about violence and working through that and personal histories and now I want to like pull my focus back out again and I'm thinking about um, the mythic feminine and I'm thinking about myths as part of the human experience and how they uh, color our, our experience of the world and our worldview and and each of these pieces as I finish them, um, some of them are, are more fiber-based like this, where I've sewn doilies on, but then I've done beading. Um, I'm adding, you know, sort of bits of old jewelry and shell and things. Um, there's a piece I'm working on right now. It's all like painted silk flowers. I, I'm thinking about these, I, I, don't, I don't know that in the strict sort of Jungian sense like archetypes, but you know, like the identities perhaps that we carry in as we move through the world in this body that do come from perhaps bigger mythic stories or um, narratives that we've absorbed that may or may not have anything to do with who we really are, right? So, so here in this cast, the you know, figure is, is like covering its breast. So like on the one hand, you could think like that's, that's very evocative and that's very, right? Like, you know, but also 
she is covering, right? So there's an attempt at being uh, perhaps a, a bit modest. So that adorning but repressing to me is is so um, very much our our Christian Puritan, right? Like uh, basis uh, in the U.S. for how social um, relations are, you know, like, and especially for women, right? Like we're supposed to be vain and we have this stereotype, like we all we care about is how we look and we adorn ourselves and we do the work, whatever, but, but you also have to be very modest, right? And women are always judged about um, or, or judged on whether or not they portray any kind of sexuality, right? So it's that interesting like line that we have to walk and so anyway, I, I'm using a lot of these feminine, what are traditional feminine handicrafts. I'm incorporating them into the pieces and trying to think about some of these conundrums that we find ourselves in, or just these ideas that come from who knows where. But you know, I think lots of mythic sort of stories that our culture tells itself. And I will, I will say thank you. That, that's all I have for you. Thank you, Susan. There we mm -hmm. go. <laughs> um, oh, so much to think about there. I did throw into the chat box when you were talking a quote from Louise Bourgeois. I've always loved <gasps> oh, Art, art is a oh, guarantee of sanity, right? Oh my I gosh, and what an amazing persona. <laughs> have you seen right? her Art 21 interview? I was just like, I want to be you when I grow up. Right. I, I want to have the kind yeah. of moxie that that right. woman had. Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can see that playing out in so many artists' work. I think, you know, when I was thinking of you all together, I had a, a sense there were some real connections here, but I, I'm so happy to see so much of it come out and that you all shared such, you know, it is, um, it's an important part of making our way through the world when you're making art and drawing all of those connections and getting out what you need to and processing everything you're going through. Right. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, we do have a couple questions in here quick before we'll probably wrap up running a little bit long, but um, um, Su Susan Angela was curious if the, the knobs on the doilies are those, I think they're beaded elements that the, the, Yeah, it's, okay. um, it's actually a shell bead okay. that's been beaded on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, Angelo is also asking, and I'm curious too, about um, for Ginny, about eyes and gaze in your figurative pieces. You're going to have to unmute yourself. Um, I think that um, sometimes the eyes are cast down and it's an introspective moment in a piece, um, thinking about you know, things in a meditative way, maybe, or something like that, um, deeply to oneself and one's thoughts. And then I think, like in the piece with the bees, I think she's definitely giving side eye. <laughs> she's, she's had some life experience and, and she's not quite happy with everything. And yeah, kind of like that. Like that question or the, the idea for the question came from looking at the um, the honey is gone piece, the bee woman. And I, I'm wondering if those eyes were the way that they were at the very beginning or if that's something that happened somewhere else in the process. Because she's she looks like she's ready to kick some ass. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that was there. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. For sure. Awesome. Um, any last questions from anybody out there? You can go ahead and unmute if you have anything to add. Um, but this was, I think, a really, really great um, chat. I think there's such interesting crossover across the, the works and what you guys are doing. I hope that all you ladies connect more because I think that uh, you've got a good little network of like-minded artists here. So thank you for coming and sharing with us. We're so happy to have had you. Um, and everybody out there, you've got a chance to see the show. It's going to be the best designed show of the biennial at the art museum. So come check it out at the South Dakota Art Museum before June 13th if you get a chance. 
And thank you all so much. Take care. Have a great night. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.